I have to congratulate all of you because I have been so impressed with the collaboration that I've been seeing amongst the groups. I'm really, I've seen some of you even working on homework together, and I've loved the way in which I've increasingly started to see that you're copying all of your group members on the emails to me. That is a true sign that that collaboration is beginning to occur. However, I do know that this is the moment where some of you are thinking, man, that dang group member, yep, that's going to be the one, the one that never shows up for anything. But please remember that maybe that person is just struggling a little bit. Uh, I know this is hard to believe, but we actually have some freshmen in this class, right? I know. And, and freshmen are still at the point where like, they don't even know where Turtle Rock is yet. That, I mean, right? Like, they, you know, they, they think that the buck is something you go hunting for, right? I mean, this is where the freshmen are. So please give them a call. Um, send them a little text and say, you know, hey, come on out and join us with these group, you know, this group work. We'd really love to have you engage. And, and hopefully send just a little bit of a, a handout to help them out because it could just be they're struggling a little all in all trying to find out what's going on. So that being said, it could be that a freshman is leading your group right now, so I won't make those unequivocal statements. Um, but I've been all in all very impressed. Please, if you haven't had a chance yet, get me a topic today. I was just speaking with Rachel, and she was like, do you, you know, Rachel, do you need us to um, narrow our topic down? They're focusing in on prions. And I don't. I don't need you to narrow that topic right now. What will naturally occur is as you start to comb through the literature uh, and you become more and more engaged, next thing you know, you're not at the buck, you're reading literature, and you're thinking, wow, the next possible direction that this literature could go might be X and X based on the current studies. That will naturally narrow your focus, okay? So that's when I want to see the narrowing is when you send a hypothesis to me and that hypothesis will should, should naturally narrow down the focus on what direction you're planning to take, for example, with your prion diseases. So does that make sense? Everybody feeling pretty cool about where we are with the poster, the group assignment? Nice. And I know that at this point is a good chance your group is going to turn their attention to study for the exam. Um, I highly encourage you guys to get together, make sure you study a little on your own first, and then get together um, and talk about some of what you maybe are confused about. That's a great way to go about getting ready for the exam. So the exam will be a week from yesterday. And as we talked about, the time frame is pretty open. You can come in throughout the day on Tuesday. In the past, I've had some trouble with people still hanging out there at 10, 10.30 at night. I know, and I'm going, oh, I've been here since 7 this morning. Please finish up or I'm going to faint on your exam. And so I'm hoping that we can finish up a little earlier in the evening. That's kind of my objective, my goal. Let's see how we can do. Uh, some of you have come to me with constraints throughout the day on Tuesday. No problem. As I said, just make sure you're on my calendar for another time if you do need to take it on a day other than Tuesday. That being said, gram stain report is the next thing coming due in lab, although of course now you'll always have those pre-labs. I'm not going to announce those anymore. Uh, you'll always want to get those done. But your first assignment won't be due until a week from tomorrow, so next Thursday. Sound good? Questions, concerns, comments, like just random outbursts because, you know, you had, like me, too much coffee for lunch. Okay, yes. Yeah, great, great. So format on the exam. Um, the multiple choice questions are 1 through 25. Those are somewhat similar to your homework questions. They won't be identical, but they're kind of that same nature. Probably a little easier because none of them have multiple answers. Um, you'll just mark one bubble on the exam and that's it. Okay. Now, the next questions, 27 through 31, uh, well, 26 is the one you have to answer, right? That one, everybody has to do. You have to draw the gram positive and gram negative cell wall structures. I would appreciate colored pictures because I have to grade 125 of them. So if you would give me something interesting, I would absolutely love that. But I do want to know that you know the gram positive and gram negative cell wall structure. 
The next one's 27 to finally answer your question. 27 through 31 will be free response questions where I will actually be asking you an open-ended question. Usually, it's not an essay per se. I'm not looking for flowery, verbose, like thesis statements in your answers. Um, but I am looking for a complete answer. Maybe it is only one word that answers it, but you'll be coming up with the answer. It won't be any kind of recognition, multiple choice. It's free response. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I'll tell you in the reviews exactly what topics are covered on those free response questions. So a big part of the way that I structure my review sessions is that I actually do indicate exactly what to expect on question 27 through 31. Cool. Yeah, this is such a great question. So the question is, how long will the exam take? I have structured it to take roughly an hour. However, that being said, some people like to hang out for three hours. Others are in and out of there in 30 minutes. So it really does depend upon you. If you can afford a two-hour block in your day, then I would say that's a great idea, just because you, don't feel, you won't feel stressed then. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Kenda. Uh, do you want to scan for the no, you do not need to bring anything. And the bubble sheet that I have attached, I grade it by putting holes in another bubble sheet and marking on it. So if you would like to fill out that homemade bubble sheet with, you know, bright fluorescent green, I'm so up for that. In fact, it makes my day. So anything else? The rainbow ones actually kind of make my day when they change colors throughout the bubbles. Yeah, please. Um, so like lab on Tuesday, do, do we like still have a lab? Yeah, yeah. So I know this seems like I am a bit of a hard ass on this. We, we will have lab. We still keep on chugging with, chugging with lab, which I know it's kind of weird. It's weird having me in lab too and feeling like those are so connected, but we will see, still be chugging on lab that day. Now, if you're in a big bind, and you're like, the only two-hour block I have on Tuesdays is my lab time. It's like the only time. Well, we can work that out. Just let me know, and we'll figure something out, OK? Yeah, Doug. It is. Yeah, it's on the regular website, like the open access website under exam reviews. It's up. The review? Oh, you mean the online run on conferences. As soon as it buffers, right? And I don't know exactly how long that takes, honestly. You know, as soon as my conference ends, I think it starts to buffer and it'll get uploaded. But I honestly have never looked to see, is that an hour after? Is it? I would guess it's less than an hour afterwards that it would be available. Yeah. yeah. OK, anybody else? If something comes to you mid-lecture, you finally wake up and think, oh, I have a question, let me know. I'm totally fine to take a break. But I do want to jump in because today we get to finish off gram-positive, gram-negative cell wall structure. And I fully anticipate your engagement because your TAs did such a good job of already giving you a preview for this. We're going to go into a little more detail than your TAs did yesterday in lab. Um, and we're going to spend a little time looking at the nuances of not just the peptidoglycan structure in gram-positive versus gram-negative cells, um, but also many of the other components of those cell walls that distinguish them from one another. We left off with peptidoglycan, and I was very sad about the loss of my model, which was that plastic ball that showed that peptidoglycan is two things. It is very rigid and provides structure to a cell wall, but it is also very porous, which means that it is not the selectively permeable barrier that we see in a membrane. Peptidoglycan does not serve the role of being a selective barrier. It simply serves a role of being a somewhat malleable, yet kind of rigid barrier to the cell that gives it some structure. It's kind of like an external structure to that cell. So permeable, yet uh, it is definitely giving structure. It is a little malleable. So my plastic ornament that I lost was the best demo ever. And I'm awaiting you guys making good extra credit models, which, by the way, models are always worth extra credit. Um, please don't bring me the ones that are like the back of your notebook that you tore off and you like somehow fashioned it into something that might in your mind look like 
a ribosome or something. <laughs> Those are, you know, I've decided they're just not going to be worth extra credit. I'll, I'll totally give you kudos. I'll give you a pat on the back for them. <laughs> um, but good models, good models are always worth extra credit. So let's look at the fact that whether or not you're talking about an E. coli cell or a Staphylococcus aureus cell, or said another way, E. coli is what? Gram positive or gram negative? Gram negative. Remember how that cell stained pink yesterday? Gram negative. So E. coli is our gram negative. Staphylococcus, any of the Staphylococci, are gram positive. Aureus is no exception. Notice that in E. coli, although both of these bacteria have peptidoglycan, the structure differs just a little bit. When we left off last time, we were mentioning that in gram positives, we typically see this pentaglycine interbridge. The presence of this interbridge is fairly indicative of a gram positive, and you will notice here that you see it in Staphylococcus aureus. However, in E. coli, recognize that the diaminopamelic acid is directly linked to the D-alanine of the neighboring tetrapeptide chain. So there is no pentaglycine interbridge there. And that is a distinguishing feature between E. coli cells and Staphylococcus aureus cells. Now you'll also notice what else is different between the two. Doesn't quite look the same. The amino acids, excellent, right? So whereas we see the mesodiaminopamelic acid being the fourth amino or the third amino acid in this four amino acid chain, we notice that over on the Staphylococcus aureus, that is in fact a lysine residue, and we see an amidated glutamate here that is an unusual amino acid in the Staph aureus tetrapeptide chain. So we just might say in a sort of broad swooping statement that the amino acids, the weird amino acids of the tetrapeptide chain, are different in Staph aureus than they are in E. coli, even though they're both kind of weird. Um, and we said that that was so that the bacteria wouldn't um, be scared of the proteases that typically degrade protein. So said another way, we'll just simply leave it as there are differences, minute differences, even though E. coli and Staph aureus have peptidoglycan, they're not exactly the same. One thing that is so important, and I'm probably going to state this about 50 bazillion times, is that we do not see anything like peptidoglycan in eukaryotes. So those of you who have a little bit of interest in medicine, um, and I was thinking, like, Lauren, right off the bat, um, and a lot of you do, what can you tell me is the major application of the fact that we don't see anything like peptidoglycan in eukaryotic cells, um, namely in us? What is the major application of that? Jen, you look like you're pondering. What are you thinking? No? <laughs> no, I'm just like, yeah. You bet. Exactly. It makes it so much easier to target. Because if we've got a structure that is unique to bacteria, man, can we design drugs that wreak havoc with that structure and do not affect us. So drugs like penicillin, ampicillin, amoxicillin, these are all drugs that target peptidoglycan. And there are many other antibiotics that see that as their site of targeting. So because there is nothing like this in eukaryotic cells, we can design drugs that target bacterial cells uniquely and that can allow us to treat diseases caused by both gram-positive and gram-negative bacterial cells Although, let's make it known that what kind of cells are most easily targeted by peptidoglycan uh, inhibiting drugs? Gram positive. Why, Lauren? They have more peptidoglycan, and what else? There's nothing outside of it protecting it. So it is both external and expose, it's both external and it must be more, right? That we're seeing that being a much easier thing to target in gram positives than it would be in gram negatives. What does protect the gram negatives? Another membrane, right? Called the outer membrane. Okay, good. I'm just pushing you to remember the structure here as we dive in. Really quickly, lysozyme is an enzyme. And so not only do we make synthetic drugs that target peptidoglycan, but our body is also naturally doing that. When you cry in your tears, you can isolate the enzyme lysozyme. And guess what? Lysozyme breaks the bonds between NAM and NAG. Said another way, it breaks what kind of bonds? 
glycosidic. Yep. So this is pretty cool because it's your body's own way of helping you fight infection. That is, lysozyme in your tears is one form of your immune response in your secretions. We see it also in other secretions. Hit me. No. Yeah, no, it's, it's always a great question to bring up. And it is so confusing because... The mechanism of action of penicillin has nothing to do with why you might be allergic to it. Um, allergy is your body saying, whoa, that penicillin looks like a foreign invader to me. And so your body mounts an immune response against that penicillin. So it's not actually related to the fact that the penicillin is targeting the bacteria more that your body just sees it as foreign. Does that make sense? Cool. Yeah, very great question. And those allergies, of course, can be uh, a big problem for the about 1% to 5% of people who are allergic to penicillins. Let's now zoom in on the gram-positive cell wall. And we're going to take a couple different views of it. You all just told me that the quintessential feature of a gram-positive is the thick outer exposed layer of peptidoglycan. That peptidoglycan may be from 20 to 80 nanometers thick, aka you may see as many as 30 sheets all stacked on top of one another in the uh, outer layer of a gram-positive cell. So in my drawing here, you're noticing that I have a very thick purple layer. That is to indicate the peptidoglycan of that layer. You'll also notice that it has a cytoplasmic membrane internal to the peptidoglycan. And you might remember that are, there are a couple of acids that stick their heads out and away from the gram-positive cell. These are called tychoic and lipotychoic acid. Anybody remember what the difference is? What, is, what distinguishes lipotychoic acid from tychoic? Yeah, good deal. It links to the membrane rather than to the NAM residues of the peptidoglycan. So that distinguishes the lipotychoic acid. It makes sense, doesn't it, because it anchors in lipid, right? So now, if we think about what tychoic acid is, it is a polymer of either glycerol or ribotol and phosphate residues. So this polymer is also drawn on the board. I wanted to be sure we had a visual to help us understand what these tychoic acids look like. So these long polymers, and they've got the glycerol alcohol, but they've also got these phosphate groups. And what is the overall charge on those phosphates? Negative. So what is the overarching charge of a gram-positive cell? Negative. Okay, That's where that confusion can come. The reason that they're called gram-positives has nothing to do with charge. It only has to do with the fact that they retain carball fusion. That's why they are called gram-positive. Okay? So let's also note that these tychoic and lipotychoic acids are in many ways like the pirate flags of the gram-positive cell. That is, they are the indicator to your body that you have a foreign invader. Said a sexy-minded way, they are immunogenic. They trigger your body's immune system to respond to this foreign invader. So in that way, they contribute then both to the negative charge of the cell. There's also some evidence that they contribute to structure of the bacterial cell, and they are recognized by our body's immune system. They are immunogenic, or another sexy term for that is antigenic. Antigen means foreign invader, so something that's antigenic means that it is a pirate flag that our body recognizes as being foreign. Let's look at a more up close and personal image of this, the uh, gram-positive cell wall. And you can see in this picture, the peptidoglycan, NAM, and NAG are kind of more intimately spelled out. But we could even zoom in further on there, couldn't we? We could even zoom in so far as to show the tetrapeptide chains. Um, and maybe the pentaglycine interbridge, if we really wanted to show nuances. But there's our tychoic and lipotychoic acids giving that negative charge. So we've got some models up here. I really like this one. 
this was a student that put the gram positive cell on one side and gram negative on the other. So this is a flippable model that I am going to pass around so you can take a look at it. You can see that they've shown the tychoic and lipotychoic acids with the green pipe cleaners. Definitely works out pretty darn well. And I'll shoot that your way. So let's look at gram negative cells. You all told me that the thing that distinguishes them is the fact that they have an outer membrane. That outer membrane lies beyond the layer of peptidoglycan. But what is true of the peptidoglycan in a gram negative? It is very thin comparatively to the gram positive. One to two layers generally of peptidoglycan is all. So not only do they have a thinner layer, but it is a protected layer, and it is protected by that outer membrane. The outer membrane is pretty unique because the outer leaflet of the outer membrane is mostly made up of a molecule, a very famous molecule called lipopolysaccharide. Typically, we call it by its short name, LPS. So remember what I mean by outer leaflet. Remember that all good phospholipid bilayers have both an inner leaflet and an outer leaflet, so there's the inner leaflet, and then the outer leaflet would be there. Well, in a, gram in a gram negative cell, the outer leaflet is comprised primarily of a different kind of molecule that is lipopolysaccharide. And in a moment, we'll look at the ultrastructure of LPS. Yeah, yeah, Julia. Yeah, you know, I, I think you should just get real creative. And, um, but I want you to show me details on that, that cell wall. You don't need to go so far as to show me the intimate pentaglycine bridge in the peptidoglycine, unless you want to, right? It's, oh, gosh, you guys, it's so cool. I just have to tell you a story really quick. Uh, one of my biochem students from summer came by today, and she specifically came by to show me. It's an online class in the summer. She came by to show me her metabolism poster that she had opened up an old paper bag flat out and drawn the intimate details of metabolism on there. And you guys will do a metabolism poster for your third exam as well. And it was the raddest thing I have ever seen. But what she said to me is important here. She said, the more I draw, the more I want to draw more. And the class is over. It's been over for months now, right? We got done in uh, late July, right? Early August is when we finished biochem. And she's still drawing on her poster. So the take home message of this quick story is the more you draw, the more you're going to want to draw. So just start drawing. That's the greatest way, greatest way to study. Um, so go home, do it right away. Maybe get your old plastic bags or paper bags out and draw on the backs of those. But draw these cell wall structures and think about the details and think about how you would show those details in your way, in your style, and tell me about those layers. So that being said, lipopolysaccharide is the most famous layer of a gram-negative cell. We'll see why in a moment. Inside of the outer membrane is a region called the periplasm. It is the region encased between the inner cytoplasmic membrane and the outer membrane. Get this, sometimes that region can comprise 20 to 40 percent of the volume of the cell. So the periplasm can be pretty darn extensive, and it is thick. It's thick and viscous because there's so many enzymes that do their jobs in there and transport proteins and whatnot. One of the types of enzymes that will be found in the periplasm is that which synthesizes peptidoglycan. So uh, interestingly, for those who care, called penicillin binding protein actually plays a role in synthesizing peptidoglycan, so named for the antibiotic that inhibits it rather than for what it does. So in there is all these enzymes. It's pretty thick, pretty viscous, and it houses this thin layer of peptidoglycan. We can zoom in on the outer leaflet of the outer membrane, and we can look at the ultrastructure of lipopolysaccharides. So said another way, this molecule right here, let's zoom in and look at what its actual structure is. You guys can tell me a little bit about it. What are the two macromolecules that you can obviously tell it's made of? Lipids and carbs, because it's a lipo polysaccharide, okay? So let's look at the lipid and carb regions of this molecule. So we've zoomed in, 
and here is our LPS molecule. And notice that there is uh, there are two distinct regions of carbs. So here we see all the monosaccharides linked to one another by glycosidic bonds. Here we see the lipid region. I want to start in the middle or core region of the polysaccharide. This core region has a lot of phosphate groups. And as you told me before, those carry a negative charge. So they impart the negative charge to a gram-negative cell. So this is part of the... Uh, the overall net negative charge of a gram negative. Now, we also see another region of the carbohydrate. This is called the O side chain, or it's also often termed the O specific antigen. So remember, what does antigen mean? Triggers an immune response. So the O side chain triggers an immune response. It is the pirate flag of a gram negative. It is what our body sees and says, whoa, gram-negative invader. Um, and it does trigger the immune function. Now, this is also uh, a region that is utilized for identification because it varies across gram-negatives. And in fact, this particular gram-negative for which this LPS is shown is actually salmonella. So salmonella, obviously one of those bugs that our body doesn't particularly like to have in the gut that causes a lot of uh, foodborne infection. And so the triggering of the immune response is part of why you get so sick when you get salmonella infection. So O specific side chain will vary and it will be that um, triggering response. Down here at the bottom though is another reason we get sick with uh, with many gram negatives. This is a region called lipid A. You already told me that was the lipid part of that. But lipid A is very special because it has the ability to act as an endotoxin, specifically an enterotoxin. Enteric meaning gut. So this is a toxin of the gut. So this enterotoxin definitely causes some of those symptoms that are uh, like food poisoning symptoms. So lipid A is embedded in the lipid bilayer. We see that on the big picture view. Stabilizes the outer membrane and acts in a toxic way. It enables LPS to act as an endotoxin, specifically an enterotoxin. Now here is something that's going to fascinate you. As it turns out, if your body is exposed to nothing more than LPS, you will get violently sick. Why is that weird? Like if I just gave you, this is a horrible idea, but if I just gave you an injection of LPS, why would your body undergo fever, chills, and eventually shock? You're triggering an immune response. Is there a pathogen there? No, <laughs> false threat. <laughs> but guess what? Our body's immune response is the most powerful thing ever, right? It really is. So if you trigger that, your body's immune response, that is a big part of why you get sick. So it's, it's very interesting to think that just the LPS toxin alone can cause that response. And lipid A is the reason for that. Now, LPS has some other functions, and obviously it depends on whether you're talking about how we feel about LPS as human hosts versus how a bacterium feels about LPS. And obviously for a bacterium, LPS serves a very important purpose. For one thing, it provides that lovely restrictive barrier. The outer membrane is very much a protection to the bacterial cell. In fact, it keeps things like bile salts from getting in. And so that's why gram negatives live happily in our gut and why we're super happy that our actual microbiota that we like in there can live in our gut, right? So this is a protective layer to it as well. And it's also something that allows the bacteria to adhere to surfaces. And many gram negative bacteria form something that we call a biofilm. And a biofilm is a complex slime encased community of cells. Uh, so that might be something to jot down because biofilms are definitely trendy. We're talking about them a lot right now. And in fact, Zach just the other day brought up 
uh, a conversation about biofilms in lab. So these complex slime encased communities, you can see why a molecule like LPS would help bacteria form a biofilm, right? It would enable them to all adhere to one another. Uh, it's got that nice sticky polysaccharide that's like, woohoo, you know, we can get close and form a community in, inside of this nice encased uh, sort of protective layer. So this may enable adherence to surfaces, biofilm formation, creates a perme permeability barrier to things like bile salts, but also antibiotics, right? Remember that the outer membrane protects gram negatives from things like penicillin and ampicillin and amoxicillin. Whew. I just said a lot of words about LPS. How are we feeling? Pretty good? Okay. Definitely a very trendy molecule. Pretty trendy. Okay. So I have some models, um, seeing more models here. Now that we've gotten through a little more coverage, what is this? A gram positive or a gram negative cell? Gram positive, right. They've done a cool job of showing the thick peptidoglycan layer. Also up out of the top, they're showing the tychoic and lipotychoic acids, right. Um, so the sad thing is that I lost my gram negative model. Once again, I'll just say that one more time. Um, so you guys need to get to work on that gram negative model. So we need to have another good, good gram negative cell. All right, questions at all about gram negatives? Let's look at the last kind of features of gram negatives. Um, not only is LPS in their outer membrane, but they also have some other things in their outer membrane. For example, they have um, a lipoprotein, which actually is um, the most common protein in the outer membrane. It knits together the outer membrane with the peptidoglycan. So it's actually like the, um, oh, it's like the safety pin that holds together the outer membrane to the peptidoglycan, kind of holds it together. So bronze lipoprotein is a very famous protein that is the safety pin that joins together the outer membrane with the thin peptidoglycan. And then additionally, there are porin proteins that span the outer membrane of a gram negative. And these form pretty sizable pores in the outer membrane. So we know that outer membrane is protective, but it's not as selective as a cytoplasmic membrane. Um, for example, a sucrose molecule weighing at what, like 342 Daltons, right? Molecular weight units. It can pass right through a porin protein. But anything over like 600 molecular weight units can't. So this is somewhat restrictive while not being very restrictive. Uh, a disaccharide can get through, but a huge polysaccharide can't get through. So that kind of gives you an idea. So porin proteins do let quite a bit in. Here they are, those porin proteins, gateways into the periplasmic space. And we see our outer membrane with its lipopolysaccharide. So there's the epic LPS molecule. Here we can see better our periplasmic space and our cyto, inner cytoplasmic membrane. I hope at this point you're getting ideas for how you want to draw your cell walls, maybe the models that you want to try to build and the ways in which you want to try to get super intimate with the structures of gram positives versus gram negatives. We're going to have a little bit of a question. Uh, and in fact, I have a couple of questions for you guys. So let's, let's pause and do and pull in for just a couple minutes. Gesundheit. So, peptidoglycan would be found in the cell wall of the bacterium Bacillus subtilis that we worked with in lab two. Okay. Peptidoglycan in gram positive cells contains less glycine than that in gram negative cells. Peptidoglycan would be found in the cell wall of diatoms, which are beautiful crystalline algae. Um, peptidoglycan contains the sugar derivatives NAM and NEG. Peptidoglycan is impermeable to most substances except for tiny hydrophobic molecules. Or is it A and D or B and C? So let's poll in on this one and see what we think. So 
a little bit harder question. Maybe you want to discuss it with your neighbors. See, like we're all over the board already. Whew. I love it. <laughs> it's so much fun to watch. I have a sense that most of you are feeling darn comfortable about the statement that it contains NAM and NAG, right? That um, we know that peptidoglycan, one of the most primary components of it is that repeating NAM and NAG you know, glycosidic linkages between those sugar derivatives. So I think everybody feels pretty good about that one. But most of you are now, and we're seeing like majority, now starting to weigh in to tell us that also peptidoglycan is found in Bacillus subtilis. Bacillus subtilis was the gram-positive bacterium that we worked with in lab two. But we know that it would be found in even a gram-negative bacterium too. So bacterium is kind of the important word in there, isn't it? That we know all bacteria are characterized by some sort of peptidoglycan that is unique to bacteria, not found in archaea, and also not found in eukaryotes, good, which is why we would eliminate that it would not be found in, in algae. Um, it is also the reason that we could, um, oh, I guess I don't have it on there, could eliminate that it wouldn't be found in archaea as well. Um, but why is this one wrong? B, I guess, the second one? Why is that one? What's wrong? What's wrong with it? Yeah, it's, it's actually completely backwards because remember gram positives do have the interbridge, the glycine interbridge. So that's an, a, a wrong statement in that way. Wonderful job. Cool. Do you guys want to do one more? All right, let's do one more. And this one I think actually is just a little bit easier. <coughs> So in lab, we tomorrow, we're going to work with a bug called Klebsiella pneumoniae. And Klebsiella pneumoniae uh, is a beautiful encapsulated bacterium. Um, we're actually going to stain for the capsule. So we're going to be looking for its ability to form uh, a layer. So if this is the outer cell wall, it forms this thick polysaccharide layer, like a coat outside of the cell wall. So we'll be looking for that. But I'll tell you now that it is a gram-negative bacterium. So which of the following will typify its cell wall? Is it a thick peptidoglycan layer? Um, is it lipotychoic acid? Is it lipopolysaccharide? Um, is it a negative charge? Or is it a combination thereof? Yeah, you guys are getting fast at this. I like it. Doesn't look like there's too much debate on this one. Um, and absolutely, it has a negative charge, right? We also know that it has that epically infamous lipopolysaccharide, so the LPS that is characteristic of a gram negative. So, nice job. Which brings us to why it is that bacterial cells kind of like having a cell wall because sometimes they live in environments that are hypotonic. So this brings us to a conversation of osmosis. Osmosis is the movement of water in response to unequal solute gradients. Um, we tend to use that word kind of broadly, you know, trying to sleep on your textbook to bring it in by osmosis. Um, so the words, the words got a little bit of a, a, what an urban legend sort of use. But really it does refer specifically to water diffusion and the movement of water uh, as it does move in response to solutes. 
So notice that on this picture, we have a caucus, and we recognize that the solute concentration inside of the cell is greater than that outside of the cell. So what would we say, what would we call the environment? As compared to the inside of the cell, the environment is hypo. Remember hypo means lower than or less than? So hypotonic. Now, that being said, how is water going to want to move to even things out? In, right? Water's going to want to move in. This is where particularly gram-positive or gram-negative cells are glad that they have a cell wall. Which one really would be firmly protected against the influx of water that could cause a cell to burst? Gram Gram positives have a ton of peptidoglycan. And remember, the role that peptidoglycan plays is in rigidity. So gram positives are particularly protected against osmotic stress in that way. Though you could say that a gram negative is also protected by its, by its peptidoglycan. It's just a little thinner, um, but certainly very, very protective. So the cytoplasmic membrane is forced against the cell wall, but that turgor pressure is not necessarily a negative thing for the bacterium. It doesn't burst because of the cell wall, and it kind of likes it. Because guess what? Water's rushing in. It's bringing good nutrients with it. So most gram-positive cells and gram-negative cells really don't mind a hypotonic environment. Now flip that around and have the opposite, where the salt concentration is very high outside of the cell, and now we get a hypertonic environment, and the water rushes out. Now is when bacteria really don't survive well. They don't like plasmolysis, which means that the uh, water rushes out, their membrane shrivels and pulls away from the cell wall, and they die. You all have probably used this to your advantage. I, I didn't see Drew. Are you here? Yeah, oh, right there. Um, you're, you hunt, right? Do you, do, uh, do you tan your own hides or any of it? Um, not. Like, I've messed around with it a little bit. Like kind of tired. What is one of the techniques, though, that's really common for, like, treating it? Or, like, the one where there's either, like, animal bone grains and stuff? Yeah, that's one that's there. But oftentimes there is some kind of, like, s treatment that you do. You salt. salt, right? So what is the goal there of the salt? Dehydration. Good. Yeah. And this also comes into play with food if you are going backpacking, right? And you're like, man, I've got all this great buffalo and I really want to eat it. What might you do? Salt, right? Salted meat is preserved meat. I, I like to try to make beef jerky, though it rarely turns out very good. But, it, you know, right? That is the idea behind beef jerky is that we treat it with so much salt that we pull the water out and we preserve the meat. And that is one really good way to do that. But notice that you also are killing bacteria, right, that might uh, contaminate that meat. And that's really the goal of the preservation, the preservation element there. So the cytoplasmic membrane shrinks, pulls away, and they die via plasmo plasmolysis. Um, that's not something that those cells particularly like. There is a wonderful poem that some of you will be familiar with um, by Samuel J. Coolridge, and it goes, water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink, water, water everywhere, and how the boards did shrink. Right? He's referring to salt water, and because the, the uh, solute concentration is so high in the salt water, that water is not drinkable because it is so hypertonic to our cells that it would dehydrate them, right? It would pull the water out. And then he says, and how the boards did shrink, right? They shrunk because the water rushed out of the cells, right? So that's one way I think, I think of that poem when I think of osmosis. Now, sometimes bacteria are subject to the bursting effect and one of the times is when they lack a cell wall. So say that you have mycoplasma, right, or thermoplasm. Remember, those are ones that lack a cell wall. So based upon that, they may not survive very well in a hypotonic environment. 
Also, there are cases where the cell wall can be removed. And in that case, what would happen in a hypotonic environment? They would burst, yeah. So protoplast is the term given to a cell that completely lacks a cell wall. A spheroplast has a partially degraded cell wall, so it's going to be more sensitive to osmotic pressure. So in a spheroplast, we sometimes create them on purpose in a lab. So let's see if we can connect concepts. How, what enzyme might we use to create a cell with a partially degraded peptidoglycan layer? Oh, yeah. What does that make? Sexy mind. There you go. Right? Remember how lysozyme cuts the bonds between M and A? So sometimes when we're working in the lab, we might work with a gram-positive bacterium and do a lysozyme treatment of it, knowing that we're partially degrading the cell wall. And the objective or goal of that might actually be so that we can better put in gene sequences into a gram-positive cell. Uh, that is to say that a partially degraded cell wall might better allow DNA uptake by the cell. So we may purposefully make a spheroplast using lysozyme treatment. Nice. Or maybe you could say that sometimes your tears make spheroplasts of gram positives. Right? That's, that's, the, what, that's the next line you can use when you break up with somebody. My tears, they are, they are making spheroplasts of my gram positives. <laughs> um, oh dear. <laughs> so some bacteria are further protected by layers that are even outside of the thick peptidoglycan. Some of these layers include a thick polysaccharide coat. We give a name to that thick polysaccharide coat. We call it glycocalyx. Now, there are two types of glycocalyces. Uh, the first type is called a capsule. And as I said, tomorrow in lab, you all will stain for a capsule on your Club CL and ammonia. You will look for the presence of this uber thick polysaccharide coat. Now, the capsule is distinguished from something that we call a slime layer because the capsule is very uh, highly organized layer of polysaccharide, whereas the slime layer is very diffuse and irregular. And we often have trouble staining for a slime layer in vitro. In vitro means mad scientists doing it on the bench top, right? Bench top science. That's what that means. In vivo means in the body, right? So where staphs, for example, will form a slime layer in the body, we rarely have much luck, luck seeing it in vitro on the bench top, right? Which is true of a lot of things, actually. We could have a deep philosophical discussion about that. But we'll skip it and talk about S layers. S layers are different than glycocalyces because S layers are comprised often of polypeptide and or uh, you see sometimes some glycoprotein, but protein, right? Lots of peptide bonds in these. And they form these very distinctive layers. So if you've ever found yourself staring absentmindedly at really cool floor tiles in a big building, and you're like, man, those are just cool. The patterns, they're cool. I do, I do stuff like that all the time. Um, and, and those patterns, that's exactly what an S layer looks like. So many scientists have preoccupied themselves for many years studying these intricate floor tile-like S layer patterns. And guess what, chemical engineers? They've studied them enough to realize that they make incredible biomimetic membranes. That is, they have completely even pore sizes throughout the S layer that allow them in engineering to make itsy bitsy tiny pore size filters that have a lot of applications. So S layers have many applications. 
But in any case, protein or glycoprotein, common amongst both bacterial and archaeal cells, they are protective. Bacteria with S layers, bacteria with capsules, bacteria with slime layers are protecting themselves against predators. For example, uh, bacteria that bore themselves into the cell and eat the cell alive, they're protecting themselves against those predators. They're protecting themselves against viruses, and they're protecting themselves against phagocytosis. Remember that that is the process that our white blood cells use to try to degrade these, these uh, bacteria. And bacteria that have capsules on them, they simply slip away, right? Every time a white blood cell tries to engulf an encapsulated bacterium or a bacterium with an S layer, they simply just slip out of its grasp. So S layers are very protective against phagocytosis. They also may help the cell with adhesion. They may help the cell form a biofilm and form that complex slime encased community. They may help with cell shape and rigidity but certainly in all cases, they are very, very protective. Lastly, we have bacterial sheaths. Sheaths are more like long tube structures that some bacteria produce to encase an entire community. So picture a chain, like a kind of a strepto, right? A chain of bacteria, but they're all encased in what looks like a straw. You know, the straw is the sheath. And you can think about why that might be beneficial to have a whole community encased in a single straw-like structure. It might be a good way to live in a collaborative way, and many do do that. So this diagram helps you review glycocalyces, slime layers and capsules, versus S layers, the distinctive floor tile like protein and glycoprotein, versus a sheath. So on that note, have a wonderful day, uh, and I will see you tomorrow for capsule staining and endospore staining.